Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for the Monday Q&As. Sorry if it's a little loud, I have a lot of people hanging out in the other room here talking and being loud. And today I'm going to limit this to just 10 questions. I only got about two hours sleep last night. Sorry I was out all night again. And I had a busy day today, including a lot of shooting and business meetings. So, I'm only going to do 10 questions. Hopefully I'll be able to do more next week. But we'll see how it goes. Alright, first question. Do you still stand behind HST, which is hypertrophy-specific training, as an optimal program for early intermediate looking to pack as much mass as possible? You didn't quite word that correctly, but we're going to roll with it anyways. Do I recommend it for optimal? No, I hate that term, optimal. Optimal is a buzz phrase. You will never find optimal for a program. What you should look for is things like good, very good, bad. Put programs in categories like that. There is no optimal at least none that you will ever find for a specific individual. Is it a good program for this purpose? Yes. Intermediates who want to pack on a lot of size quickly who are not on any drugs, and maybe even those who are on drugs, uh, will find HST to be a particularly effective program, although they might be able to skip some of the early ramp-ups for people who are just starting the program new, if they're a true intermediate already. So I would still stand behind it. Yeah, I stood behind it a couple of years ago. I still stand behind it today. All right, next question. Why do teens make slower gains in general compared to adults? Well, there can be a couple reasons for this. A lot of times people say, well, they're producing so many anabolic hormones, they should be able to make faster gains, they recover so much better. Well, there's a couple of issues there. Number one, uh, most teens are obviously still growing. Their energy is putting other efforts into building their bone structure, building their organs, various things in their body. So it, that seems to be one possible reason why they do gain muscle a little slower in spite of all of that. Uh, the other reason being that teens do focus, well I don't know so much if the word is focus, they have trouble focusing as much and staying consistent with things and working as hard oftentimes as adults do and more mature people do. And accordingly sometimes they're going to struggle to get the results because of lack of consistency, lack of, of consistent hard work with what they're doing and focus. So those are a couple different factors that do seem to play a role with teams in their games. All right, next question. If you plan on competing at 181 pounds, have you thought about trolling the community by then going on a lean out and entering a bodybuilding competition? No, I really haven't. And I'm really trying to be cooler about not giving people a hard time for the bodybuilding thing and understand that different people have different goals and say, you know, if that's what people want to do and that's their goal, you know what, I'm perfectly cool with it. I don't even mind giving them some advice. However, it's not for me. If I did it, it would be not only purely trolling, but some sort of publicity stunt to make more money. But at this point, it, it just doesn't interest me enough to do it. It's just not my thing. I don't find it interesting or fun. Yeah. So it's just not in my plan. I just don't see myself doing that. Yeah. All right, next question. When would you say powerlifters can begin training their weak points? Well, when they truly develop weak points. The thing to consider, though, is just because you are weak at something as a novice early on doesn't mean that you have a weak point if everything is weak. But I would say for a lifter at any point in their training, if they start to see clearly defined weak points developing, whether they're at six months, 12 months, two years, wherever they happen to see them start developing, it would probably be a wise idea to allocate some of your training time to working on those specific weak points. It would probably be wise at that time once you've clearly identified them. But they're not, not something that could just be improved by working more on the main list or just getting stronger in general. So when you see those clear weaknesses actually developing, that would be the time to address them no matter how experienced you are. Just don't assume that ones are there that aren't actually there. All right, next question. Forearms for hypertrophy, frequency and exercises. Well, as far as frequency goes, now I know I don't always have from every angle massive forearms because I don't really do any for extra forearm work. I deadlift and row. That's about it. But for people who this is an issue, who want bigger forearms for a variety of reasons, uh, obviously frequency needs to be as high as you can get away with, whether it's two times a week, three times a week, five times a week, whatever you seem to be able to adapt and recover from. Volume doesn't necessarily need to be that high if the frequency is high, at least on a day-to-day -day volume. And just any basic exercises, heavy wrist curls, reverse wrist curls, and any sort of wrist rolls are fantastic. You can get a stick and just roll plates up and down on a rope. Those things can develop really thick muscular forearms in addition to just doing more training without straps. 
Okay, next question. Thoughts on a 30 to 60 day juice fast, 100% fruit juice, leaves, and salads. I really hope you're trolling, bro. If you're asking something like this on my channel, these sort of fasts and cleanses and stuff that people do are stupid. There's no science behind them. All you're doing is risking potential deficiencies and certain fatty acids and proteins and things like that. There's, there's no reason I would recommend that anybody do something like this. I don't understand what the point would be biologically, what your goal would be. There's no point in doing it other than potential dietary imbalances and, and being malnourished, being deficient in something. There's no reason to do something like that. All right, next question. Hey Jason, the plates at my gym are not circular and do not roll. When deadlifting after I rep it, it's hard to get the bar back in its original place. I find this to be a pain, constantly adjusting my body and feet to the awkward bar position. Thoughts on this? Yeah, just any gym where you have to deal with these hexagonal plates where they're going to hit the, the floor and roll and adjust and stick in an awkward position. What you have to do is just rest pause training. You have to reset every single rep. Don't try to do everything. Reset your feet. Reset your body, everything, and pull again on each rep. You're going to have to turn it into rest, pause, training. And you know what? That's perfectly viable for deadlifts year-round. It's nothing lost. It's a viable method to train that way anyways on the deadlift. So just go ahead and do it to make the situation at your gym work. It's not really a problem. Uh, that's what I would do, and that is what I have done when I have had for a short period of time uh, access to just these type of plates because that's where I was training at a 24-hour fitness years ago. So that's what I've done. It's not a problem. All right, next question. I have been hearing a lot of doctors are recommending subcutaneous injections for testosterone therapy instead of IM, which is intramuscular, to reduce scar tissue. What are your thoughts on subq? Thanks, Jason, fan of your channel. Uh, I'm actually a little bit of a fan of the subq these days for TRT. Now, it's obviously people who are using copious amounts of, of gear that aren't inside the prescription doses. It's not going to work as well. But for people who are doing just uh, a standard prescription dose, a lot of doctors are finding this effective. Research is showing it to be good that for some people it keeps levels more stable throughout the week if they just do subcutaneous injections in the skin on their stomach. But obviously it needs more study, but the research so far seems to be pretty promising and it seems to be a very effective and viable alternative, keeps scar tissue down. And yeah, it, it seems to work just fine. So I'm an advocate of it. A lot of medical doctors are also at this point. Not all of them, but quite a few of them are now. All right, next question. Hi, Jason. If I feel more satiated with higher fats when cutting, is it okay to keep fats high and carbs low as long as I'm in a calorie deficit? Well, you mean like what I do right now? That's, that's what I do right now on my cut, and I've dropped 40 pounds doing it that way. Nothing wrong with it, as long as you aren't getting so glycogen depleted that your performance is suffering, so you might need to do carb ups. But yeah, if this sort of dietary approach keeps you satiated longer, keeps your energy better, better blood sugar control, things like that, there's certainly nothing wrong with eating higher protein and fat and keeping carbs lower while in a calorie deficit, as long as your performance is holding out and not taking a major hit perfectly acceptable. Just don't think that it gives you magical fat loss. It's just a, it's a method of satiety and controlling your total intake. Alright, next question and last question of the week. Jason, you are obviously an avid coffee fan. Have you tried Kobe Luwak? The most expensive coffee in the world that civic cats chew up and defecate out before it becomes the coffee known as Kobe Luwak. And what is your stance on the ethics behind drinking it since Indonesia is practically force feed the caveats in cages. You know what? I've been offered this and I refused it and I know it's supposed to taste delicious. Everyone said it's a coffee with no bitter taste and it's just amazing and it's really expensive and when I was offered it one time I didn't drink it just because of the pure fact of the idea of consuming something that has passed through the GI tract and been pooped out by an animal just isn't really high on my list of priorities to do. It just seems gross to me. I didn't want to do it no matter how much they talk about, well, you know, it's been roasted again and all the bacteria is killed. It's just gross, man. I wouldn't want to do that. I didn't do it. Wouldn't try it when I was offered it one time. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it has been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time. But let me give you guys a bicep shot before I go. Oh, Mount Bicephus.